Merry Christmas. Church, you look good. It's good to see you. I'm glad that you're uh, here today on this Christmas day. I saw that uh, <clears throat> it will be 11 years before Christmas is on a Sunday again. So, uh, goodness, there'll be some people here today that won't be here in 11 years, right? And, uh, and who knows where we'll all be in 11 years. I'm uh, great 2034, I guess that would be. Uh, we had an amazing Christmas Eve uh, service last night. Uh, I know that those of you who were here would agree. <clears throat> it's been really, really cold, right? We might have to add frozen pipes to uh, lights and gifts and tinsel and all the other things associated with Christmas. I hope that you're not uh, hope that you're not compromised too much by uh, by the freezing by the freezing weather. Many of you are no doubt gearing up to go serve after the service at the Christmas Day lunch. We're grateful uh, for that. <clears throat> the ways that this church reaches into the lives of people in this community and meeting needs. Uh, it is noticed. It is seen. It meets real needs. And we're grateful uh, for those of you who, uh, to, who do that and support it and pray about it. So how many of you have not opened your Christmas presents yet? You haven't opened? Some of you have. few of you haven't. Uh, we've yet to uh, do that. <clears throat> we've got a couple more family members or my son and uh, his family are coming in a little bit, so we have a couple of events. So, But if you have not opened up your presents yet, you don't know, do you? You don't know whether you're on the naughty list or the nice list. <clears throat> in fact, <clears throat> there's a chance that some of you are here today thinking that being in church might just push you over the line and out of naughty and into the nice category. You know, gift giving is, is really a, a special thing, and gift giving... Uh, and especially giving a special gift reveals a lot about both the giver and the receiver. Now, I'm not talking about the generic gifts that, you know, some of you go and you buy six of this one particular item and you put them somewhere in case somebody shows up unexpectedly and brings you a gift. And you say, oh, I have a gift for you as well. And you get one of those. And not talking about that, that kind of, of gift I'm talking about a special gift, a gift that has purpose, that was purposely picked out with the tag. You put on the tag, it's from me and it's to you. It reveals something about the giver and the receiver. You know, the giver is kind of in the control uh, seat when it comes to gift giving, but the receiver does have a role. The, what good is a gift if you don't open it and, uh, and use it? But, but the giver, the, the, the giver, when you give a gift, you, givers usually give to show their love and their appreciation to show you that they know you. They know what you're in need of or they know what you want. And that the giver finds great delight in seeing you smile or be happy once you receive what you wanted or what you needed. And Christmas, of course, is about God giving to us. God knows us. God knows what we want and God knows what we need. And in Jesus Christ, he has given us both. He has given us the greatest gift of all. He's given us what we needed most and what we wanted most. Let's say it like this. When God gave his greatest gift to us, he gave himself. Not just uh, gifts, but himself as the gift. And when you step back for a moment, and especially we who are Christ followers, and you think about the things that you have in your life, you think of them as blessings, blessings that have come from God. You think of things like your life, right? That's a good starting point. And then you think of your health. You think of your family. You think of things like abilities or gifts or talents or maybe some accomplishment, things that are both tangible and intangible. We think of those things, they're things that we once did not have, but now they're present in our lives. And we attribute that to God because we believe God is the giver of gifts. James, the brother of Jesus, uh, after Jesus' resurrection, after the church begins to proliferate, James becomes the pastor of the big church in Jerusalem. And he writes this about those blessings and the way that we feel about them, James 1.17. He writes, every good gift and perfect gift, every good and perfect gift 
is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So all of those blessings that God gives us, you realize that they come from a greater reality. They come from a deeper truth in that we have received God's greatest gift himself. And everything else that he gives us, he gives us out of that starting point. So our, our study this uh, past Christmas, our series has come from the first two chapters of Matthew. And uh, today we're going to be in, in, in the gospel of Luke. So in Luke's chapter, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. In Luke's gospel, we're given more detail about the few days just preceding Jesus' birth and a few days after. What's interesting about Luke is that Luke was not an eyewitness to Jesus' life like Matthew was, like John was. He wasn't an original disciple. In fact, Luke was a Gentile and not Jewish like the other gospel writers. Luke was a doctor, a physician. He was a learned man and a studied uh, man. That's probably why his gospel highlights several accounts of Jesus healing people from, from disease. Luke joined Paul on parts of his second and his third missionary journeys. And the, the, one of the things that, that's interesting about Luke's gospel, when he begins, he says, there are a lot of accounts that have been written about the life of Jesus. And so I've set out to do my own research, to write the most detailed, accurate account possible. So it is very likely that Luke interviewed Matthew and probably Peter, possibly John, some of the other disciples. We even believe that it's highly probable that Luke had the opportunity to sit down with Mary while in Ephesus and get the story, get the details. And so he, he writes his gospel, Luke chapter two, and uh, it's what has become now this well-known Christmas story. And I wanna read through it with you this morning. And as we go through, we're going to get to a point where I want to point out two words, two key words that are gifts from God, this God who has offered the greatest gift, that of himself. So Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Luke records this for us. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the household and the lineage of David. Luke covered that in the opening message on that genealogy. This is his ancestral town. And Augustus has, has uh, ruled that people go back to their to that city to register for a census so they would be taxed. But we've talked about this is God sovereignly at work, arranging circumstances, making sure that his prophecies will be fulfilled. And that's how they get to, uh, to Bethlehem. Verse six says, and while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And then maybe, just maybe, maybe the best verse in the whole Bible, verse seven, Luke 2, seven. And she, Mary, gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. You know, uh, sometimes, we give, sometimes we give the innkeeper a hard time. We don't even know if there was an innkeeper. He's not mentioned in the story. We've just kind of created him. It's just that this time is, is chaotic, it's crazy. People are being, you know, moving from city to city to get back to their ancestral town. We don't know why they didn't get there in time to, to, to get a room at an inn, but they didn't. And so, of course, Jesus is born in this, in this makeshift, in a stable. He's placed in a manger. But again, this is God coming as one of us. And then in these next verses, here's where I want to point out these two words. Verse eight begins this way. <clears throat> and in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with great fear. 
Can you imagine? I mean, that's kind of an understatement. You're out in the dark, you're doing your job, and suddenly there, suddenly there's an angel that begins to, to speak. But before that, the glory of the Lord, whatever that's like, this, this light that has enveloped them, and they're scared, they're probably scared to death. And you know, angels don't look like the little cherubs in the Christian bookstore. Angels are bad to the bone, right? They're, they're warriors. And so verse 10 says, and the angel said to them, the single angel said to them, don't be afraid, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. There's the first word, the word joy. I bring you good news of great joy, and this news of great joy is for all people. And then, verse 11, the, the announcement is this. The good news of great joy is this. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. That's the second word, Savior. On both occasions, this angel says, God is giving you something. He's bringing to you, delivering to you, sending to you good news of great joy. And that good news is a Savior. By the way, what, what does a Savior do? He gives the gift of salvation, right? That's the other word, joy and salvation. Those are the two words, joy and salvation. Then Luke gives us more detail. The account of that evening goes on as follows. Verse 12, the angel says, and this will be a sign for you. You'll find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And then, note this, verse 13, and suddenly there was with the one single angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. I don't know, there's eight, 10, a dozen or more scenes from the scripture that I, I hope, I don't know if this will ever be the case, but I hope God would might maybe let us see them in replay uh, one of these days. I wrote a, a morning fuel about this. I think it's the one that may perhaps aired on Friday. Maybe we could get a redo and we could see this one happen. This would be in my top five list. There's a single angel and then suddenly there is, it's described as a multitude of angels. I've all, I oftentimes wondered, what if, what if God summoned all of the angels that there are to gather in the sky for this one single night to announce the birth of the Savior. Glory to God in the highest and peace on the earth. And then this text goes on, verse 15. <clears throat> when the angels went away from them back into the heavens, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known to them the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. So back to these two words, joy and salvation, those two things. Let's make this statement about joy. See if you would agree. The gift that we all want most is joy. The gift that we all long for, desire, and want the most in our life is joy. And you can think of it as fulfillment, as significance, as happiness. We're all on a pursuit for joy. We all know what the opposite of joy is. We don't we don't want it. And joy is this thing that is essential to the Christian life. The scriptures are clear from, from beginning to end that, that God's people are both commanded to rejoice and we're characterized by rejoicing because joy is the thing that we all want most and joy is the thing that God gives to us. In this announcement, the, it was announced as good news of great joy. So the gift that we all want most is joy. And then the second statement, the gift we all need most is salvation. The gift that we all need most is salvation. 
In the very same way that our universal desire and longing is for joy, our universal need for every single one of us is salvation. Salvation is needed when one is in a condition of danger and, they're, and they come to a point where they're unable to do anything about it on their own. That is our need. We break God's law and and when we do that, we only have to break it one time and we're defiled and we're, we're, we're not holy. There's a holy God and unholy people. And we need a Savior who can do for us what we're unable to do for ourselves. And in the giving of Jesus, God, who knew what we wanted most and gave us joy, knew also what we needed most and gave us a Savior to save us. The gift that we all want most is joy. The gift we all need most is salvation. Let's talk about joy for a moment. Joy, that gift that we want the most, that gift that we want the most. I love the, the angel announced that night to the shepherds, I bring you good tidings or good news of great joy. And this news of joy is for all people. You know, we Christians, we sometimes split hairs over words and sometimes that's necessary and good. Joy and happiness are one of those, one of those examples. Joy is similar to happiness, only joy goes deeper. Happiness is a positive response emotionally to the current moment. It, 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 an event or a situation or a person can make us respond with happiness or they can make us unhappy. But joy goes beyond the moment. Joy is a happiness that, that is at the level of the soul. It's like a disposition of the soul. Joy can be had when we understand that the message delivered by the angel that night is that God has come for us, God has saved us, and we can trust him. So when the event or the situation or the person causes me to feel unhappy, I can still know that God has come for me and I can trust him. I, I can trust that he's with me. I can trust that he loves me. I can trust that he's working in the situation or the event or the person. I can trust that he has forgiven me and saved me and given me his Holy Spirit, made me his own, given me eternal life. That's when I can experience joy. The psalmist writing in Psalm 94, it's a psalm dealing with adversaries and trying to overcome those who are, are intentionally trying to harm him, turns to his trust in God. And Psalm 94, 19 says this, when the anxiety was great within me, it was your consolation that brought me joy. It was your comfort. It was the fact that though I'm, I'm overwhelmed, like we all get sometimes naturally <clears throat> by the events or the circumstance, or the person, and, and the fact that I can trust that you are doing what I cannot do, that you're looking out for me, and even though I can't see it, and I'm overcome with anxiety, that truth about you brings me joy. I know that you, if you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard a guy like me say, or some other Christians say, you know what you need to do? You need to choose joy. Joy is something that you choose. Even though, <clears throat> you, know, you know, when you don't have joy, just choose joy. Like it's an item on the shelf that you can just reach up and pull off and make it your, make it your own. It's better than that though. Joy is a gift that has been given to us by God. It is the thing that we desire and want the most, and God in his loving kindness chooses to give it to us. You don't really choose joy. What you do is you choose to receive the gift of joy that has been willingly offered to you by God. It's like, Lord, in all of the emotions and the dispositions that I can have today, I choose to receive your gift of joy. I bring you good news of great joy unto you. Born this day is your Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And that's the second, that's the second gift. Salvation, the gift, that we, the gift that we need the most. The gift that we need the most. You know, in, his, <clears throat> or in the announcement to Mary, 
recorded in Luke 1, the angel says, you will name him Jesus. You will name him Yeshua, a Hebrew word that means God's salvation. We saw in our study the announcement made to Joseph that the angel said, you'll name him Jesus, Yeshua, because he will save his people from their sins. And that is true. The greatest thing about the gift of Jesus is that he saves us. He forgives us of our sins. He restores us to God. But God wanted more than that. Yes, he wanted our salvation from sin's penalty, including eternal separation. He wanted our victory over sin's power in our everyday lives. God knew that we needed that most, and so he gave the Son to save us. But those are the things that we're saved from. In the giving of this gift, he's also saved us to something. And we see perfectly and clearly in Jesus what it was that God wanted to do and what he wanted for us. And what God wants most is this. He wants a relationship with us. Not just save us from sin and from hell, but to save us to himself. Because what God wants is a relationship with us. It's a wonderful gift. God has saved us from sin and its consequences, but he has saved us to himself, a relationship with God. To know him, to know his character, to be intimate with him, to think of him and call him and trust him as a good heavenly father. And church, you already know this because this is happening to you or has happened to you. It is in the relationships of your life where you are truly changed. You get changed in relationship, for the better or for the worse. And God, born in the flesh, into the everydayness of our normal nitty-gritty world, because he wants to, to be in our lives. He wants to come into our lives. He came to save us and to have a relationship with us. He longs for that saving relationship, and that's what he wants most for you and for me. Not just in the big stuff, like sickness or tragedy or a place to worship on Sunday mornings or something to hold on to and believe in, but in the day-to-day -day mundane, otherwise normal garden variety, seemingly insignificant stuff. Even in the no room at the end, in, in the end part of the story, that's just part of the ordinariness of life. We've all been turned out or turned down, or rejected. He comes into the messy stuff. He came the way that he came. God gave the gift the way that he did so that we could relate to him. The Savior is relatable. He's like us. To be known by him and to know him intimately, what he wants most from us is relationship. God wants relationship most. And maybe you're a person, maybe you're a person, possibly, and you've never wholly committed your life to Christ personally. Maybe you've come close, kind of like to the edge, but never really fully committed. Possibly you identify with a certain faith tradition, and that's your faith. And maybe you know that God is great and God is good, but as far as, but as, far as worshiping Him, not, not in here, only, but the other six days of the week. As far as feeling intimately connected to him, you know, you would know that you're not. And if you don't have an intimate relationship with God, it's usually because of a reason, maybe a couple of reasons. Maybe it's that you feel that what you already have is already enough. Maybe you feel, you know, your parents drug you to church when you were a kid and you felt like somebody was beating you over the head of the Bible. Or maybe you feel like God let you down at a time in your life when you needed him most, or he did it in the life of your parents. Those reasons prevent people legitimately from fully trusting in God as an, in an intimate relationship with him. Or maybe for some, you have legitimate questions that you can't get answers to and nobody will, can answer them adequately, like suffering in the world or bad things happen, uh, happening, especially to good or innocent people like children. Maybe, maybe you don't believe in miracles. 
Maybe it's because you don't like church people, because you know some, and they don't act the way you think they should. Those can be legitimate hangups. They're valid. They're huge. They, they were some of mine. I at least to respect someone that has a good reason. But here's the deal. And I bet you already know this if you think about it. If you have the answer to every single God question that troubles you, it would not make you want to be in an intimate relationship with Jesus. It would not make you want to trust God. Nobody who has a relationship with Jesus Christ sat down and worked through the suffering in the world issue, got all their answers and said, okay, now let's move to miracles and, and conquered that and then said, <clears throat> now let's delve into why bad things happen to good people and got all their answers to that. I have a relationship with Jesus Christ and I still struggle with those same issues. And I've shared this before, I have more unanswered questions about God now and the whys now than I did when I began my journey with Him. I'll tell you what it is. There's something, the difference maker, there's something different on the other side of a relationship with God. And it is something that transcends these hang-ups and these problems. It's, it transcends the Christians that put a bad taste in my mouth, you know, <clears throat> about all Christians. And here's what it is. That on the other side of a relationship with God is a person. It's a person. Not just a philosophy. Not just a, 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 a doctrine to live by. It's personal because there is a person on the other side of the relationship and that person's name is Jesus. And he brings us into relationship with the Father. And, and what happens, the, the, what happens in there is, is the game changer. It, it, it's like all meaning relationships. It's the catalyst of love. The love that he, that he, with which he first loved us. And you know, you sense his love. And you love him back in return. And if you've ever fallen in love, or if you've ever experienced love, you've been so deeply loved by someone and you know that you're loved, maybe a parent or a grandparent or a spouse. Maybe now you get to be a parent and you're, you, you are giving that love towards a child. You know what this is like. You've experienced this. Men, Men, can you remember back before you were married? Do you remember being single and liking it? Hanging out with your buddies, no strings attached, just doing what you wanted to do whenever you wanted to do it. And you had reasons for why you did not get married. You weren't ready yet. And think for a moment, maybe there's some guys who are like that in here today. You aren't married, you're in no hurry. I'm describing you. Somebody would say, hey, when are you going to get married? And you had a legitimate list of reasons why you weren't going to get married just yet. They were usually in this category, these four categories. One had to do with my freedom. I'm not ready to give up my freedom, you know? I, uh, <clears throat> I'm free. Moss don't grow on a rolling stone. Not ready to settle down. Not ready to give up my social life. Don't fence me in. The second category is usually about commitment. Guys are scared of that. We're all scared of that word. Right? We hate that word. It's risky. And then the third category is oftentimes about money. You know, maybe when I get a little bit more money. I don't have enough money right now. Barely have enough money to take care of myself. Can't imagine taking care of a wife. Certainly can't imagine taking care of a family. And then the fourth one. The fourth one is usually something like this. <clears throat> what if I marry the wrong woman? What if I commit to the wrong person? I get married and she's not the right one. What if I show up at my own wedding and I fall in love with her college roommate's sister who's there at the wedding? I'm just going to tell you, dude, if you ever do that, just get in the car and drive to the West Coast and never be seen again, right? That would be safest for you. But those are huge issues, and they're really good reasons, and they make perfectly, perfectly good sense at the time. But there's just one thing that can happen that makes all those gigantic issues not go away, but shrivel into very small nothings. What happens is one day, this certain girl walks in 
and you fall in love. And you don't even know what's going on. It just happens, and it overtakes you. And suddenly, love and commitment and marriage, they're no longer concepts. They're no longer things to debate or talk about over a, a, over a cup of coffee. It's not another area of life that I have to deal with as an adult, like education or career or finances or whatever. Suddenly, it is a person, not a theoretical person that I might marry someday when things are like I need them to be. It's that girl. <clears throat> like in my case, her name was Lori and she has blue eyes. She's the one and I gotta have her. I love her. But better than that, she loves me. And the reality that she loves me makes me love her even more. That's how it happens in relationships. It's love that trumps all the other objections. The personal relationship puts into the right place all the other issues. The issues don't go away. They just move into a distant second, third, or fourth place. After all these years of marriage, I still wrestle with my freedom. Don't you? And how much of it Lori says I can have. <laughs> I still don't have enough money. Do you? I, I still face things that challenge my commitment to her. But on the other side of it is a person that I love and who loves me. And it makes the objection seem so much smaller. That's who we are when we're saved by Jesus. That's who the church is. You need to know that the true church, the ones who are in relationship with Jesus, is not about the well put together people. It's about the reality of our brokenness and our struggles and our issues and our sins. There is a person who has stepped into the middle of it to bring us joy, the thing that we want the most, and to bring us salvation, the thing that we need the most, a Savior. That is why we call it good news. And his love for us and what he has become a, a, a love for him it is in this relationship that changes everything. We'll end the way that we began. When God gave his great gift to us, he gave us himself. In Jesus Christ, he gave us what we wanted most, joy. He gave us what we needed most, salvation. And when he gave his gift to us, his best gift of all is that he gave himself. Let's bow for prayer. <clears throat> If uh, in what you need, if you're a person who <clears throat> doesn't believe for whatever reason, I get it. I have sat in your seat. But this story of Jesus, let's think about this. If it could possibly be true, wouldn't you want it to be true? That if there is a Savior, that if there is a way to be forgiven of things that I've done wrong, if there is a way to be made right with God and to know God, and it's not by my works or going back and undoing what I've done, but it is by believing faith and putting all of my trust into the Savior, wouldn't we want that to be true? God says it is. And he proved it all the day that Jesus rose from the dead. If Christ belongs to you and you have this relationship and you've already received what you wanted the most in joy and what you needed the most in the Savior, we rejoice and we celebrate his birth. If you're not, you can. He's come for you, just like he's come for all of us. And I would advise you from someone who has sat where you've sat, don't let the unanswered questions. Don't let what you think is a good, legitimate reason for not giving all of your life and your trust and your faith to Jesus stand in the way. If you had your answer, if you had the, the situation that went wrong undone, it wouldn't change. It wouldn't change your heart towards God. What should change your heart towards God is what he has done for you. He has given his son 
to live a perfect life, the life you can't live, nor I, to die the death that we all deserve and take our penalty upon himself, and then to rise from the dead to conquer that thing that none of us can conquer, death, and all that goes with it. That's your Savior. And if you will put your faith and your trust in him, the person who's on the other side of this, it will change everything for you too. Father, <clears throat> thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you for this Christmas day. Thank you that she gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. That is our Savior, Jesus Christ, and we praise you for him. And so as we move on from this worship into the remainder of this day, be glorified, be big, be celebrated. Thank you that on the other side of, of the relationship, thank you that through the, 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 the busyness and the beauty and the a chaos of, of all the celebration that if we peer through it on the other side, we see this person, this person who came to give us what we want the most and what we need the most, joy and salvation. So we thank you. We give you this time for an opportunity for our response to, to the leading of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.